Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our midday briefing. Today is, as you know, Thursday, the 3rd of November. Um, President von der Leyen is today in Berlin to participate in the Berlin Process Summit, together with our partners of the Western Balkans. The President will participate in a press conference after the summit, which is planned at around 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, as usual, we would, and as you fully understand, invite you to keep your questions on the Western Balkans and related topics to this press conference, which you can also follow live on EBS. Um, before giving you the floor, however, let me welcome also a group of Greek and Turkish Cypriot journalists that are attending our today's midday briefing in the context of a visit organized by the Commission's representation in Cyprus. Um, unfortunately, uh, dear friends uh, from Greece, Greek and Turkish um, media, we do not have the son of uh, Nicosia, but I hope you will enjoy your stay here in this press room and more generally in Brussels. So a warm welcome uh, to the press room. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, as usual, the floor is yours. Yes, in the back. I don't, think I, ever, I don't think I ever got the first question before. Uh, Yorgos Kakouris, Cyprus News Agency. Um, given the opportunity of the visit of uh, PEGA from European Parliament to Cyprus, uh, it's an opportunity to, to get the point view of the European Commission. Uh, I would like to ask to what extent does the European Commission's mandate over surveillance of citizens, journalists and politicians or regulation of spyware and technology that can be used uh, for these uh, purposes? And how far the EU has come in regulating these technologies to protect human rights and the, the rule of law? Thanks. Thank you very much for your question. And I'm happy that Christian is joining me here on the floor. Yes, also missing already the son of Greece. Um, so thank you for your question, Gorgos. Just looking out here you are. Um, look, I mean, in, in general terms, what I, can, what I can say and remind you of is that the member states are competent to safeguard their national security and they must oversee and control their security services to ensure uh, that they fully respect fundamental rights, um, including protection of personal data, the safety of journalists and freedom of expression. So uh, they must carry out any such activities also uh, with full respect um, of, of relevant uh, EU law, including case law of the Court of Justice. Um, However, the investigation of any concrete cases is, of course, the responsibility of each EU member state. Um, and therefore, the Commission expects national authorities to thoroughly examine uh, any such allegations and uh, restore citizens' trust. So, um, more generally put, I mean, the, of course, defending the rule of law is a joint responsibility of all EU institutions uh, and, and member states. And uh, what the Commission does is that we address rule of law issues uh, in a systemic manner um, to ensure that in independent investigations, independence of the judiciary, proper checks and balances, et cetera, are in place in our member states. So these are key elements of uh, our, uh, by now well-known uh, rule of law report and the rule of law annual cycle. Um, but then, uh, on concrete uh, cases and um, the application um, of the relevant rules uh, where any potential legal, legal activity should take place, uh, such as the use of illegal uh, spyware to access state of citizens, uh, this is a responsibility of the national authorities. Thank you very much, Christian, quite clear. Do we have any further questions on this topic? Uh, no, not in the chat. I do, does anyone of you have questions for Christian? Not in the room, not in the chat here in Interactio. So we take new questions. Yes, please. <clears throat> a question on foreign affairs. <clears throat> uh, so my question is that today in Poland, uh, Russian opposition politicians and public figures convene uh, to create a government in exile. And my question is, um, does um, European diplomacy consider uh, to recognize this new entity? Thank you very much, uh, Nabila.
Oh, hi, Anna. How are you? Uh, well, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, I will have to disappoint you, but I am not aware of that, so I will need to check and get back to you. Thank you. Questions on this? I don't think there's anything further we can say. Now that we have Nabila here on the podium, do we have questions on foreign affairs? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Rosie Burchard for Feature Story News. I just wanted to get a reaction on uh, the Ethiopian government and regional forces from Tigray agreeing to cease hostilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie, for your question. Um, the EU uh, welcomes, uh, you would have seen uh, the statement by the HRVP uh, that was published, I think, last night. Uh, the EU welcomes the announcement of, the, of a cessation uh, of hostilities and congratulates both the government of Ethiopia and Tigray's uh, People's Re Liberation Front for their commitment and courage towards peace. The EU commands the African Union mediation and its observers, as well as the South Africa host and uh, reaffirms its readiness to support peace efforts moving forward in a process owned by, owned by and led by Ethiopians. Now, uh, it is very important to have a swift implementation on the ground of the agreement reached uh, which is extremely needed. The priority is, of course, to resume uh, humanitarian access in all affected areas and to uh, restore basic services, in particular in Tigray. Further negotiations, are, of course, are encouraged to reach a permanent ceasefire agreement and launch broader political talks. Thank you very much. Do we have further questions on this for Nabila? Keep your hands raised in interaction if that's the case. Not in the room. Philip, no, not Philip. You unraise your hand, thank you. Yes, please. Yes, <clears throat> yes thank you, uh, Nabila. I have a question <coughs> on Lebanon. Uh, three days ago, you issued a statement on Lebanon and reminding that there is a <coughs> framework to put sanctions on those who are, I think it says, obstructing the political process. So when will this sanction be applied and against whom? Can you clarify this? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nawab. I mean, I think you've been in this uh, press room for long enough to know that uh, we never discuss <laughs> um, sanctions and any, uh, anything that has to do with sanctions that could be discussed in the council. It is a framework that is uh, there to uh, target any people who are obstructing uh, the peace in Lebanon. So this is what I can say. It is in the statement, but I'm not going to uh, uh, speculate on any other sanctions or anything or any list for that matter. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's clear. Um, let us, I don't see any further questions here, but we remain in the area of uh, foreign affairs. Uh, Mose, uh, you have raised your hand. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I would also like to ask a related question to Nabila. On another country in the region, it's about the recent elections which took place in Israel on Tuesday and, as you know, resulted uh, in the return to power of former Prime Minister Netanyahu. But this time, uh, thanks to the support of a uh, far-right extremist party. So my question is, how do you think that could, will, uh, let's say, influence uh, the improvement of bilateral relations between Israel and EU, which took place uh, during the, the previous uh, coalition government? Uh, are there any special cooperation areas uh, in that case which uh, EU would likely say to continue and develop with Israel also under its new government. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mose. First of all, I, I mean, as you know, these, uh, the elections are still ongoing and uh, this is a democratic process. So I would uh, not speculate on anything. We are happy and we look forward to uh, to work with the next uh, government that will be democratically uh, elected. Crystal clear, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions on the elections in Israel? 
not in the room. Uh, Svetlana, is your question on this topic? Well, it's Russian. It's Russian. One second. Yeah, okay. Let's go ahead. Let's go to Russia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, yes, it's for, for Nabila. Uh, the Politico published yesterday or two days ago a statement of a Czech minister for foreign affairs saying that the EU prepares to adopt a new framework, new EU framework for its relations with Russia. So I, I, I'll, I'll try to, to, to ask you a question. Do you know what it is? Could you clarify a little bit? Do you know that if there is a new framework in preparation or not? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sveltana. Look, I mean, I, I haven't seen, we spoke about it yesterday, and uh, I'm not going to comment anything that has been written in the reports. Our position on Russia has been clear since the beginning. Um, so I have nothing to add to that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Svetlana, your hand is still raised. Uh, we will not be able to say more, but uh, go ahead. No, it's, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, 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 I, I unraised my hand, uh, my head. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Svetlana. Have, do we have any other questions on uh, Russia? No, we have been with uh, Nabila to Ethiopia, Lebanon, Israel, and Russia. Is there any other part in the world um, that you would like to raise questions on in the area of foreign affairs? Now that Nabila is with us, raise your hands in the room or in Interexio. No, very good. Thank you very much, Thank Nabila. You. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions today? Uh, Philip, Philip Lawson. Uh, try to speak, maybe. Um, that may help. We see a gray screen and hear nothing. Okay, you know what, Philip, let's try again later. Um, let's go to uh, Odile Larvé. Odile, tu as une question pour nous. Uh, bonjour. Oui, j'ai deux questions. À la veille de la, la COP27, euh, on dit que c'est la, co la COP de l'Afrique. Elle se passe évidemment euh, euh, en Égypte, mais j'aimerais bien savoir aussi quelles sont déjà toutes les coopérations existantes euh, entre l'Union européenne et le continent africain vis-à-vis euh, -vis de justement de, de ce qu'on peut faire pour le, le, lutter contre le, le changement climatique d'une part si vous pouvez m'envoyer ça et d'autre part euh, on a entendu au, on a entendu au Parlement européen certaines critiques disant que la Commission avait trop d'importance dans le, la négociation à Charmelchek Je voudrais savoir comment s'articulent sur le terrain euh, les, les relations avec les délégations du Parlement européen, la délégation du, euh, du comité des régions, euh, parce que euh, d'un point de vue pratique aussi pour nous, c'est souvent plus facile d'avoir accès à, à ces, ces deux délégations euh, plutôt que, que, que ceux qui sont dans les salles de négociation, de, etc. Et on le sait, les, euh, sur le terrain, les, les citoyens comptent beaucoup sur les, les autorités locales et régionales. On l'a vu avec la pandémie et aussi euh, pour le, le, les, 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 les économies d'énergie, les dérèglements, etc. Donc, comment vous, vous, pouvez, euh, vous pouvez organiser un peu tout ça Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Odile. Sur ta première question, euh, quelle coopération est-ce qu'on a déjà entre le continent africain et l'Union européenne Notre coopération euh, date... Il y a longtemps, je dirais, euh, tu nous as demandé d'envoyer plus d'informations là-dessus. On le fera euh, volontiers et tu verras que 
il y a euh, beaucoup de choses qui sont en train de se passer, qui se passent déjà depuis un peu de temps euh, avec nos amis africains. Sur les autres questions, euh, Tim Oui, merci Odile. Euh, oui, sur la question de, de, des négociations, euh, du, du mandat, du rôle de, de la Commission, c'est la Commission, à, à côté de, de la présidence tchèque, qui est responsable de négocier, de représenter l'Union européenne. C'est dans les, dans les traités, c'est le, le mandat qui nous a été donné par, par tous les États membres. Et un mandat de négociation qui a été accordé il y a deux semaines au Conseil environnement. Mais évidemment, le Parlement européen joue un rôle important dans tous nos travaux sur le changement climatique. Et il y a une délégation du Parlement européen qui est aussi présent euh, à tous les COP et il y a des réunions euh, régulières pendant la semaine euh, du Parlement européen euh, et de, des équipes de, de la Commission européenne. Il y a plusieurs événements euh, qui, qui ont lieu ensemble dans, dans les, les side events. Et aussi, on organise un briefing press euh, avec M. Timmermans, qui est le chef euh, de notre négociation du côté du Parlement, du, de la Commission, avec euh, le, le chef de la délégation du Parlement européen. Alors, il y a toujours un briefing press avec le Parlement et puis des briefing press qu'on fait aussi euh, à côté de, de la présidence tchèque euh, qui sont organisés sur place. À côté de ça, vous avez toujours accès à une porte-parole. Euh, je serai là euh, sur place la deuxième semaine euh, euh, du, du COP27 et on a des collègues qui sont responsables pour la communication qui sont là tous les, pour, pour les deux semaines euh, qui, qui sont capables de, de vous mettre en, en contact avec tous les des experts selon leur disponibilité. Évidemment, on est là principalement pour négocier, pour arriver à un bon accord euh, en fin du COP, euh, mais la communication, euh, notre euh, relation avec les presses euh, sur place est, est très importante pour nous et on, on, on s'engage à, à vous informer et être à, à votre disposition à, à chaque échec. Merci beaucoup, Tim. Le changement climatique est un des défis les plus importants euh, pour nous et donc la Commission y travaille euh, avec les partenaires, tous ces partenaires en full force, je dirais. Euh, Avons-nous d'autres questions pour Tim euh, sur, le, sur le COP euh, Jorge. Uh, we see you, but it would be better if we hear you as well. Nope. And now? You're with us. Welcome to the press room. Go ahead. Okay, you can hear me now. Good. Thank you, Stefan. Um, Jorge Levarero, Euronews. I have a question about COP27 indeed. Well, two questions. The first one is about what's happening in the European Union regarding coal, because we see that um, some countries are resorting back to coal in order to compensate for the loss of Russian gas. Um, I also see that the, among the priorities, the EU intends to urge other countries to close the book on unabated coal. So I'm wondering, do you think this coal revival that we see now in the European Union is going to undermine your position at COP27? And the second question is about climate reparations, because this year Denmark became the first Western country to offer climate reparations for developing nations, 13 million, if I'm not wrong. So I'm wondering, do you think uh, Denmark has set a precedent, has opened the door, and these uh, new demands will be, you will face new demands for climate reparations at COP27, and how do you plan to respond to them? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jorge. Yeah, on your first question about coal, um, this is a topic we've, we've covered several times, but of course it's something which comes into the spotlight into the spotlight as we approach COP27. Now, as you know very well, um, we're in a situation where we are having a major shift in our energy landscape, uh, and that is because of Russia's weaponization of its energy supplies as part of its aggression against Ukraine and against the European Union. Um, we are in a situation where we need to replace uh, a large amount of gas, which we were previously importing from Russia, with alternative fuel sources. Now, we've made very clear um, that there are three pillars to this. One is diversification, so finding alternative uh, gas supplies. The other is investing and speeding up our deployment of renewables. And then the third is energy efficiency. Now, one of the things that we will, of course, need to do in the short term, and by short term, I mean this winter and possibly the next winter, 
uh, and, and perhaps a third beyond that, is to engage in some fuel switching when necessary to move away from gas to other fuels. And there are a number of member states that have announced that in the short term they will be uh, needing to resort to coal to ensure energy security in Europe. Now, I think it's very important to underline that this is a short-term measure to ensure our energy security and that the Commission has proposed to increase our targets for 2030 for both renewables and for energy efficiency and that our climate targets, our commitment both domestically and to, to the partners at the UNFCCC uh, is set into law. We have a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. That will not change. What that will mean is that we need to catch up in the second half of the decade uh, for any, uh, any impact that the next couple of winters have on, on our emissions, if there are any, um, through, through that extra coal use that we need in a short-term basis. But I think that is a situation which um, the majority of our international partners understand. Uh, they appreciate that the situation um, that we are put in at the moment, and they understand that Europe will remain a global leader in terms of phasing out coal around the world and in terms of raising ambition. So this is something which no doubt we will have the opportunity to discuss with our partners. We will be very clear about the journey that we're on. Um, and to remind you, the last year's COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the final agreement, the Glasgow Climate Pact, included for the first time a commitment by all parties to phase down coal, as you say. That's something which the Commission is very determined to follow up on with our international partners. Other things that we do, not just domestically, but internationally, is to work on things like the Just Energy Transition Partnership. So we signed one with South Africa last year at COP26 and are working on a number of others with other international partners to really implement these commitments to help uh, parties around the world, countries around the world that have a high dependency on coal to move away. Uh, we will be helping them to invest in the transition, to design uh, transition plans, much like we have in the European Union, to find financial support through public and private uh, sources. So there is a, a whole work of implementation which we're doing domestically and internationally to ensure that we do deliver on this phase down on coal. I spoke so long on that question, I forgot your first, your second one. Sorry, on loss and damage, yes, um, and any precedent sent by, set by Denmark. So as you say, I mean, Denmark uh, made a contribution uh, and pledged a contribution on loss and damage. This is, of course, one of the topics uh, which will be discussed in, in Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, and Executive Vice President Timmons has had the opportunity to speak about that on a number of occasions at the recent Environment Council and at the pre-COP meeting in Kinshasa. And what he has said very clearly uh, is that the European Union has a clear understanding of the position which is being uh, expressed uh, by the developing countries in particular on this. Uh, we stand ready to be a bridge builder in this conversation uh, in terms of putting on the agenda at the COP27 uh, a conversation about this. Uh, about the, the best ways to address this issue, the best financial vehicles for addressing this issue. It's a, it's a long and complicated discussion, uh, which we will have. Uh, there are different um, thoughts on how you would do this. Uh, what the Commission is, is prioritizing is using the existing financial tools and vehicles which are out there. And I would remind you that we are the largest international donor of climate finance. Uh, the Commission, uh, sorry, the European Union published last week it's updated figures for 2021 for climate financing, um, maintaining a level of over 23 billion euros in climate finance, uh, which is given uh, primarily to the developing world. Uh, that's a commitment which we, of course, will continue to respect uh, and we will maintain and keep working with European member states uh, and other bodies to, to increase climate finance. Thank you very much, Tim. Any further questions on, co yes, please. On COP, uh, I don't see any, uh, one second. Odile, you have a follow-up question uh, sur le COP 27? No, it's not a follow-up, it's another question. Uh, another question on COP. Okay, one second. I'll get, I'll come back to you, Odile, then uh, you have a question for Tim? Pardon? No, we, COP is finished. Uh, let's jump to uh, other. Uh, it, it's a question concerning uh, the, the more general uh, Green Deal and climate policies and also environment policies, which is not your uh, uh, business, but uh, uh, they, they go together. Are you worried, uh, are you concerned about the fact that the new Italian government has uh, uh, forces, uh, I mean, the, the three parties that are there, they consider 
the climate policy and the environment, uh, very often they have said this as a, uh, ideological positions. So they, they actually underestimate, uh, this is part of their political uh, um, standing, they underestimate the importance of this. Uh, so my question is, are you, are you concerned that in general, the fact that in the Italian government there are no uh, forces that uh, are actually uh, not so uh, not so uh, um, attached to the importance of the environment and climate, that this could weaken the Green Deal, the Green Deal on climate uh, and the Green Deal on the energy transition and also the Green Deal on the environment. Um, thank you very much. Listen, I don't think uh, this is a place where we would comment on positions that are taken by different political movements or parties in uh, member states. We work together with the different member states, including uh, Italy, on making sure that our Green Deal becomes a reality. We have very important challenges ahead of us in different areas, um, in the area of energy, biodiversity, agriculture. It's a very wide array of uh, challenges that we are all facing, and we are looking forward to working with all our partners, with all member states, to turn this uh, into a reality, including, obviously, with our partners in Italy. Thanks, Stefan. No, I think Stefan's point is, is very is very clear. Just to, to recall what I said in, in the previous answer, we have in place the EU climate law. It's one of the first deliverables under the EU Green Deal, and that is what legally binds all of our member states to the climate targets for 2030 and 2050. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, on this? No, go ahead. Thomas Friedrich, VDE Nachrichten. I'm looking forward to the next uh, college meeting on the agenda with the uh, CO2 passenger cars uh, evaluation on Euro 6. I would like to know if Euro 6 is not anymore on the agenda or will the Commission come up with a proposal still this year on this matter? Thank you. Good afternoon. Indeed, the proposal is still on the college agenda, the revision of the Euro 6 and the new modernized um, standard, uh, the Euro 7 standard for non-CO2 emissions will be discussed by the college uh, on Wednesday. Thank you. Listen, uh, we actually, we switch now to Sonia's portfolio, but I know there were still questions for Tim, so we'll get back to Tim in a moment. But let's now take, do you have questions for uh, Sonia? We will handle those then. Yes, follow-up. Yes, if I get it right, uh, the proposal for uh, your know 7 will be as well uh, be discussed. Okay, Indeed, I you. can confirm, yes. Thank you. Indeed, is a very short and powerful reply. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Suniva. Do you have a question for us? Ro Suniva. Was it? No, it doesn't... The, was the question for Sonia? No, it's for Tim. Okay, let's call Tim back on stage. Um, sorry for the, um, the, 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 the mix-up. Let's call Tim back on stage. Uh, but first, we're going to go back to Odile. Uh, Odile, raise your hand because I think you had a, a, another question for Tim, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we, merci. Wait. Uh, on parle de plus en plus du rôle des océans dans la décarbonisation. Je voudrais savoir quelles sont les, les, les dernières positions de, de la Commission uh, sur, uh, sur ce sujet. Merci. Bon, je dirais, Odile, que ça, c'est un sujet assez large uh, qui concerne et le, le portefeuille climat, mais aussi uh, environnement. Uh, Vous avez, on, on a le COP27 euh, qui commence ce week-end, mais on a aussi le, le COP15 euh, sur, le, sur la biodiversité, la pr protection de l'environnement, qui va suivre euh, très vite en décembre aussi. Pour nous, les, les deux sont liés. Euh, la protection du, du climat et de l'environnement euh, sont, sont interconnectées. Euh, mais vous, vous, vous parlez d'un sujet très large en disant quelle est notre proposition. 
notre position, c'est, comme vous dites, la, les océans, la protection des océans, c'est très important euh, pour le climat et pour la, la biodiversité. Je n'ai pas des positions plus précises à, à, à vous donner, mais je suis, je suis très content d'en échanger bilatéralement. Merci beaucoup, Tim. Um, do we have other questions for Tim now that he's with us here? Yes. Suniva, go ahead. Um, hi. Suniva Rose for the National. Sorry if this was asked before. I joined a bit late. Um, it's about Kadri Simpson's visit to Ukraine earlier this week. She said the EU could provide support after Russian missile attacks on Ukrainian energy infrastructure, but she said there would be limitations. I was wondering if you could confirm that the EU is exporting electricity to Ukraine, if yes, how much? And also, what are the limitations that Kadri Simpson was talking about? Uh, she also said that the need for spare parts is very big um, and that the EU, EU is trying to help. I'd like to know more about what kind of spare parts the EU will be providing Ukraine to rebuild its infrastructure. And finally, I understand that Commissioner Yanez Lenacic was in Ukraine two weeks ago to assess damage done to civilian infrastructure. Um, is his report going to be public? Can we know uh, more about the outcome of his visit? Thank you. Thank you. We'll first take the questions for Tim, and then the question on Commissioner Lenarchic is for Balash. We'll take that later. Tim? Yeah, Suniva, I think um, the best overview I can give you is actually to, to refer you to the remarks of Commissioner Simpson when she was in Kyiv on, on Tuesday. She gave a press conference at the end of her visit and spoke quite extensively about the support that the European Union, as well as member states and financial institutions, can provide and have provided to Ukraine. Um, so, of course, the, the broader envelope of financial support, uh, which we've given, uh, which we've facilitated, but also the specific uh, help in the energy sector. So, um, for example, the energy community has set up a fund specifically to support the Ukrainian energy system. Uh, and we've now mobilized 25 and a half million euros, uh, which is for helping to cover the immediate needs of the Ukrainian energy system. Um, but, of course, the, the needs are growing um, because the Russian attacks on the energy infrastructure have escalated. And the Commissioner has been calling on her, on her counterparts at the Energy Council and to step up support from the member states. What we also need to do is work with the private sector. It's often a question of the availability of specific equipment um, to, to match the Ukrainian needs. So the Commissioner has said that she will be engaging as well with the private sector and reaching out to companies in Europe and beyond uh, who have some of the equipment that Ukraine needs and, and trying to help them to, to prioritize and to speed up certain deliveries. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a, a, a range of things that we're doing in terms of deliveries in kind and financial support. Uh, in terms of electricity exchange, uh, now you know that the, the Ukrainian grid is now connected to the European energy grid since the start of the war. Um, this was a, a longer term project which was accelerated um, after the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, there have been exchanges uh, in both directions of, of electricity, um, relatively small volumes over recent months. Um, but as the commissioner has said, there is a possibility for the, for the EU to, to support further Ukraine as needed. In terms of the specific technical details, I, I suggest that I come back to you bilaterally in terms of explaining what volumes and, and how that would work. Thank you very much, Tim. Before we go to Balash, any other questions for Tim? Yes. Tim, back on stage again. I would like to know what our latest news about the uh, uh, energy package uh, trilogue uh, second proposals of the Commission. Can, are there any news you can deliver us? Energy package, right. you mean specifically? The Commission is still working on it. What, what are the latest news about it? Sorry, sorry to, I, I'm just not clear exactly which proposals you're referring to that we will be working on. After, after the uh, heads of states uh, considering uh, to, to come up with uh, new proposals and to, to, to have further proposals from the Commission side to uh, so you mean in, in terms of tackling um, energy prices and the discussions around them? Okay, sorry, um, my mistake, because we also have trilogues ongoing on the Fit for 55 and, and Repower and other things. So yeah, I mean, the, the proposals um, which we made uh, in terms of the, the TTF, uh, for example, the, the price um, corridor, 
uh, and other measures related to, to solidarity are all in the hands of the council now. It was an Article 122 proposal which we made. So the Energy Council had a first discussion uh, the week after the, the European Leaders meeting. The next, uh, the next meeting has been convened by the Czech, pre Czech Presidency for the 24th of November. Um, so that's when we, we would hope to see some progress and, and hopefully an adoption of these latest proposals. And then we would be in a position um, to do the follow-up on our side. As we said, there's a, a two-step process related to this idea of the, the price corridor and the TTF, um, where we are looking for a legal mandate around the principles, and we would then follow up with a, a more detailed proposal after that. So that's something where, of course, our preparatory work is ongoing, and we will be very quick in terms of reply, uh, responding to the mandate uh, when Council gives it to us. Thanks. You had a question for Tim? For Tim, no point. For Tim. Yeah, Tim, uh, uh, this is something that uh, I think uh, needs clarification. Uh, I, I know the, the Commission position is clear uh, what you say now. Uh, you, the Commission has put on the table uh, a, a proposal for a regulation on the 18th of October. Uh, the Council didn't didn't approve that on the on the uh, the last time the 25th of October that has to be approved in order to go to the next step which is the the, the oper operational uh, proposal by the Commission this is what I understood uh, you told me once this is a two-step uh, process so uh, the position of the Commission is we need the, co the council to approve the, the the proposal for the regulation in order to have the next operational uh, proposal. The thing is, the position of the council is we are waiting for the commission. The commission, the ball is in the in the commission uh, <laughs> camp. So, uh, can you can you say clearly what uh, the situation is on this? I mean, to confirm this. Yeah, Lorenzo, you you correctly explain what the the two step process is. When you say the position of the council is that they're waiting for a proposal um, from us, I'm I'm not exactly sure who within the council would have expressed that position. But I mean, we had the Energy um, Council, as you said, on the 25th of October. That's when the presidency um, got the first input from from ministers, and when the presidency scheduled the next meeting for the 24th of November. So you know, the council clearly needs to do further work on that regulation. Uh, and as soon as they can do that, we will be ready to, to quickly do the second step in the proposal that we've, that we've made. Thank you. Um, I see that uh, Alberto in the um, interaction also has a question. This is for Tim, I would assume. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, two weeks ago, there was an agreement amongst uh, Spain, Portugal and France for a new pipeline connecting the Iberian Peninsula from Barcelona to Marseille. We've been told that the President von der Leyen is going to be invited to a uh, summit in, in Alicante uh, the next uh, 9th of December uh, to discuss with the, the Prime Ministers and the President Macron uh, about this issue. And uh, my question is if the European Commission is committed to uh, fund this, uh, this new pipeline, uh, as we've been told from the Spanish government, that is its intention. Thank you. Thanks, Alberto. Yeah, I've also seen these reports that the president would be invited to this meeting. I don't know if we've received a formal invitation. And in any case, we usually only communicate the president's agenda um, slightly closer to the dates, but I'm sure we can come back um, to that issue soon with, with Eric Cordana. Um, as regards this specific project, um, the, the Barma project um, from Barcelona uh, to Marseille, the commission, uh, as, as I've said before, welcomes the political agreement between France, Spain, and Portugal on this project. Now, we're ready to support projects that meet our Repower EU objectives, and the Commission is now awaiting further details on this project before it's able to take a, a firm position uh, on those details. Any additional cross-border infrastructure project from the Iberian Peninsula um, should be further assessed by the member states and the project promoters first. Now, just to give you a, a broader context on what could potentially, uh, potentially be eligible for funding, um, as we said in our, in our re Repower EU plan, additional investments to connect those LNG in import terminals to the broader pipeline network through hydrogen-ready infrastructure uh, may contribute to diversifying our gas supplies away from Russia. 
and allow us to tap into the long-term potential which comes with renewable hydrogen. Uh, just to remind you, we have uh, a long-standing um, project uh, financing instrument for, for cross-border energy infrastructure, which is regulated by the 10E regulation, Trans-European Networks for Energy. We revise that legislation in line with the European Green Deal, so fossil fuel infrastructure is no longer eligible for funding. But what we can fund uh, through future projects um, for, for in, in the future uh, through this program is hydrogen infrastructure. Now, there's a process which goes on in terms of forming lists of projects of common European interest, and the next list of projects will be published by the end of 2023. So now it's member states, regional groups, project promoters, which discuss uh, potential candidates, put forward uh, candidate projects, and the Commission will adopt that list before the end of next year. Uh, and that list would then be uh, have to be approved by, by Parliament and Council. So that's uh, some of the, the framework of uh, financial tools that we would potentially have. Um, but as I said, um, we need to see the details of this project before we're in a position to say what the eligibility would be. Thank you very much, Tim. I don't see any further uh, questions for Tim in the room, nor Interaxio, so we'll take other questions. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, yes, please, go ahead. And then. Merci, Stefan. Luis Tobar, Telecinco, Mediaset España. So in question paga poco Next Generation EU Funds and, and Spain, um, on sait que l'Espagne est le premier pays qui, qui a reçu des paiements et est en process de demander les, les troisième. Mais il y a un point qui dit dans notre, j'imagine, dans tout le plan de récupération, qui dit que l'Espagne doit justifier, expliquer avec quoi elle investit l'argent. Et apparemment, il aurait un retard avec ce document qui est nécessaire pour avoir les troisièmes et des autres paiements. Donc, je voudrais savoir si effectivement il y a ces retards et si l'Espagne s'expose à quelques sanctions ou avertissements pour, pour, par la Commission européenne. Merci. Euh, merci beaucoup. Je ne sais pas si on est en mesure de, de, de te donner une réponse sur ce point maintenant. Tu sais que euh, euh, tous ces instruments suivent les règles du cadre réglementaire qui s'applique. Euh, Dan, tu as peut-être quelque chose Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I think I can only reply very, very generally to this question uh, with the following points. So I think that you know well at this stage that the implementation of the Recovery and Resilience Facility is fully on track. Most national plans are in place and implementation is firmly underway as we have put in place a Recovery and Resilience Scoreboard showing clearly how the money is being spent. Now, I think it's important to point out that you can see this information online, and I would invite you to, to regularly consult that for the latest updates on the RRF and its implementation. As regards Spain in particular, Spain has to date received two RRF payments, and the implementation of the Spanish plan is currently in line with the agreed timetable laid out in the Council implementing decision approving the plan. Thank you. Other questions for... Yes. <clears throat> Uh, thanks. Jess Parker from the BBC. A slightly different topic. Um, the UUP leader, Doug Beattie, has today suggested that Article 16 should be triggered to try and, as he's put it, uh, provide time and space to achieve a negotiated outcome on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, I just wanted to get a sense of what the Commission thinks of this um, suggestion and also any updates that you can give us in terms of the negotiations that are going on between the UK and the EU. Are they going well? Thank you. Thanks, Jess. It'll come as no surprise to you that I don't have any comments to make on comments. Um, that, is, that is our established practice here. All I would want to do and say is that our commitment to finding joint solutions with the UK is absolutely unwavering. This is the only way to bring uh, certainty, uh, predictability to Northern Ireland. We're engaging at technical level with our UK counterparts. Those meetings, those discussions, those exchanges are ongoing. And that's all I'd have to say for this moment in time. Thank you, Dan. Any other questions for Dan? No. I realized that we still had a question to which Balash was supposed to give an, an answer. Apologies. Uh, Balash, could you come? Uh, to the podium, 
This was about um, Commissioner Linarcic in Ukraine. Yes, very briefly. Hi, um, I thought I would chip in a bit on the energy front as well and, and say a few words about what we've been doing uh, to help Ukraine together with our colleagues uh, in our energy department. So uh, our humanitarian and, and civil protection uh, department is also very much engaged in trying to um, help Ukraine solve um, um, problems in the field of um, electricity uh, uh, generation. Um, you might know that uh, since the very beginning of the invasion, uh, we have an open request from Ukraine um, in the context of the uh, civil protection mechanism asking for a variety of um, em emergency items. Um, and this is being adjusted constantly, of course, as um, the situation is evolving on the ground. Um, most recently, we've uh, seen a more emphasis given to um, uh, power generation capacity, electricity uh, uh, generators. And up to this point, I can confirm that we have um, offered um, more than 400 uh, electricity generators to um, Ukraine via the EU civil protection mechanism. Now, overall, um, I would like to recall that um, we have been extremely uh, determined to, to use the mechanism to channel assistance to Ukraine. Um, all the 27 EU member states uh, have participated in this exercise, um, and we also we have also had four uh, participating states um, of the mechanism sending um, assistance. Now, in terms of the visit of the uh, Crisis Management Commission in Ukraine two weeks ago, um, I'm not aware of any um, report coming out of, of this meeting uh, or, or of the meetings that he had. Um, in terms of uh, a needs assessment, um, I, I think that the needs will evolve on the ground constantly and we will try to um, cater for those needs uh, via um, the mechanism. Um, important to recall that we've already um, reached more than 500 million euro in terms of humanitarian aid that we've announced for uh, Ukraine this year. This is essentially one third of our uh, regular um, uh, annual um, uh, budget. And we've also focused recently on providing winterized shelter uh, uh, to Ukraine. Um, more specifically, we've um, offered uh, more than 500 uh, winterized um, shelter units, which will be or which are being delivered to Ukraine um, um, these days. So um, we will continue to assess the situation on the ground. Um, our Ukrainian partners will tell us where the needs are, and we will do our best to respond uh, in a very rapid manner. Thank you very much, Balash. Any other questions for Balash? No. Okay, then we open the floor to other topics. Yes. Yes, um, Mattia Bagnoli, ANSA. This is, um, I think, a question for Anita, is migration. Um, I wonder whether the Commission is following the case of the ship Humanity, which is carrying migrants off the coast of southern Italy. It is not the first time that this has happened, but um, Berlin this time has urged Italy to provide support for this ship, which operates under a German flag. At the same time, another ship, the Viking, is asking help to France because Italy and Malta apparently are not answering. I would like to ask you first what the Commission guideline is in such cases, and secondly, what is the state of play of the proposal on migration? Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, we are following the situation, as Anita will explain. Uh, yes, thank you very much. As you know, the Mediterranean route continues to be one of the most active routes where lives are put in danger every day by criminal networks. We, have, uh, we are following the, the situation very closely and uh, we, um, uh, we have seen that, and according to our, that are according to our available information, there are three ships uh, with uh, around 1,000 persons uh, on board on three vessels that have uh, asked for a safe uh, place for uh, disembarkation. As such, as you know, uh, the Commission is not involved nor is responsible for the coordination of such operation at sea, uh, nor in defining um, a place of uh, disembarkation. Nevertheless, um, we recall that saving lives at sea is a moral duty as well as a legal obligation for member states under international law, independently from circumstances which have led people uh, to the distress uh, at sea. Thank you very much. You have a follow-up. The second part of the question, Anita, was the state of play on the uh, 
proposal on migration what is you can share with us if there is any um, momentum on that if there's anything that you can share yes thank you very much we have a momentum as you know um, uh, on on the pact on uh, um, migration and asylum we have a, a welcome we have welcomed a political agreement that was on the 7th of September between the Parliament and the Council we also have now a joint ro roadmap um, on the common European asylum system and the pact on migration we see it as a clear commitment from both the Council and the Parliament to conclude all the necessary negotiations of the legislative uh, proposals on asylum and migration uh, management uh, before the end of the current legislative uh, period um, by February 2024. And of course, we are supporting actively the co-legislators um, to start the trilogues as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any further, uh, further questions for Anita? David, yes, go ahead. Oui, merci. Euh, selon selon l'accord euh, qui avait été conclu par la présidence française euh, pour la première phase de euh, construction de la confiance euh, sur le pacte, etc., euh, il y avait... Euh, un accord pour euh, euh, redistribuer 10 000 personnes euh, dans l'Union européenne. Je voulais savoir à quel point est euh, cette partie de l'accord, euh, combien de pledges ont été faites par les États membres, combien d'engagements, et si c'est possible aussi savoir euh, si on peut utiliser euh, cette partie de l'accord pour les trois embarcations euh, qui, pour l'instant, ne peuvent pas débarquer en Italie. Merci. Euh, oui, en effet, euh, on a eu une déclaration euh, euh, de solidarité euh, qui euh, représente une avance importante euh, pour, pour l'Italie. Euh, les États membres se sont engagés à mettre en euh, ouvre un mécanisme de solidarité volontaire simple et prévisible, Um, on a eu um, uh, 8 000 um, de, uh, de, de pledges et on a eu déjà le premier relocalisation um, qui ont eu lieu depuis l'Italie. Uh, en août et en octobre aussi de cette année, uh, on a eu 38 candidats à la relocalisation qui se sont rendus en France et 74 en uh, Allemagne. Merci beaucoup, Anita. David, je vois que tu as une question de follow-up. Oui, je, je, voulais savoir, euh, euh, je voulais savoir si on peut utiliser ce, ce, ce accord, sur cette déclaration de solidarité pour le cas spécifique euh, des, des trois embarcations qui sont bloquées. Euh, David, pour, euh, pour les nouveaux mécanismes de solidarité euh, volontaire et le débarquement euh, à la suite d'opérations de recherche et de sauvetage, oui, euh, on, euh, cette, euh, ce mécanisme est, est dédié, dédié euh, à ça. Euh, et, euh, comme tu sais, euh, ce euh, système volontaire de so solidarité euh, était euh, mis en, euh, en force euh, pour euh, tous les, les pays de la Méditerranée euh, qui ont besoin de, de support et aussi euh, suite d'opérations de recherche et de sauvetage. Merci, Anita. Avons-nous d'autres questions pour Anita Not in the room, not in interaction. So we open the floor to other questions you may have. Anything else for us today? Nothing in the room. Also nothing in interaction. So then we'll end this, but allow me to remind you of the fact that uh, tomorrow you're all warmly invited in our press bar after the end of the midday briefing. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you.